I think trees are really the most magnificent organisms on Earth. Trees link the earth and sky. There are these connectors between the mundane world of where we walk every day and the sky, which has this sense of, of the celestial, of something that's bigger than ourselves. I think one of the most amazing feelings is when the mist and fog and cloud roll up the mountainside and it hits the forest, it hits the tree in front of you and you suddenly realize you are being enveloped in a cloud. Well, I think that people, scientists, when I first started tree climbing, felt that it was just a stupid thing to do. In fact, I remember my graduate committee saying, oh, that's just Tarzan and Jane stuff, Malini. What is, that's just a gimmick, you know what? Why don't you just stick to what everybody does on the forest floor and just forget the canopy? I used to climb trees for fun all the time. And now, as a grown-up, I have made my profession understanding trees and forests through the medium of science. People were just beginning to sort of apply mountain climbing techniques to get up into the canopy. Um, there was one group in Oregon when I was a graduate student that actually put pitons into the trunks of trees and then climbed them just like, you know, a rock climber would climb a mountain. You know, which is horrible to think about, you know, sticking pitons into to trees. The combination slingshot fishing pole is Nalini Nadkarni's own invention for shooting a line 100 feet up. But my passion are the plants, the so-called epiphytes, those plants that grow up on trees. They don't have roots that go into trunks nor to the forest floor, but rather it is their leaves that are adapted to intercept the dissolved nutrients that come to them in the form of mist and fog. And what you see is this soil, and it's just riddled with roots. It smells great, it's like this very earthy smell. Tropical cloud forests really have some of the most diverse and abundant plants that grow up in the treetops. And Monteverde in particular fosters these, I don't know why they're so amazing, but the strangler figs are a really important structural and, and, and sort of compositional part of the forest. They sort of dominate and poke out of the, the general canopy and you see these, these crowns just sort of emerging out of the, the forest as a whole. Well, if we start at the beginning, we start with a seed of a fig. A bird or a monkey might pluck one of those to eat. They might drop that fig or they might eat part of it and a fig seed will fall on a branch. That seed then might germinate and it might have enough resources of light and of water and of nutrients to grow into a little seedling. It's like that scene in Jurassic Park when like the head tilts and it's like doo -doo 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 -doo. It's like a huge fucking dinosaur right there. <laughs> if you like trees and if you like fig trees, like Monte Verde is Mecca. De fijo. Como no hay otro lugar que tenga tantos árboles, tan viejos, 
con formaciones absurdas, like just overhangs and crazy bends on the trees and crazy holes on the inside. At least when I was growing up here, most of the kids spent our time running around and exploring the forest and climbing trees. Then I stopped for a while, you know, did the whole like school thing. I went to the States and lived there for a year and wanted to see what a city was like and being able to have bowling alleys and movie theaters and stuff like that. Uh, and when I came back, it was a lot easier to appreciate this forest and, and the fun stuff that I had enjoyed so much as a little kid. Uh, so I started exploring more and more, and, and climbing was like a step further. It was like a way for me to prove that I had a, a capacity to, to push the limits a little bit. None of my friends wanted to do it with me. They were like, oh, let's go hang out or drink or something, you know. It would be me alone and it'll basically be a, a free solo with uh, just a rope tied in. <laughs> For some reason, the rope being tied in gave me like some form <laughs> of comfort. Then I got Rafi climbing with me and he had worked at, at a tour company. So he knew knots and stuff like that. We started climbing together and to have a partner was like a huge, step up like we could do now so many more things I never felt the need to be inside <laughs> maybe my mom was always like Rafi venga para adentro ya es muy tarde o está haciendo frío está lloviendo like you know when you're a kid and they tell you you can't do something and then like you really want to do it I think that's sort of what it's like <laughs> like how could you man look at this book No, no, because like you don't have to go towards them. Okay. They're on the back side of the tree, which makes you have to climb the underside, <laughs> which is <laughs> really nice. The special thing about the strangler fig trees is as they grow, they make these like ladder tangled up shapes that we can use to place the sling. And then after the sling, put the quick draw and then attach a rope to it and keep going. Our goal is to climb them and do like a clean ascent of the tree um, without, hopefully without falling. And then the gear is just there just in case, right? In case we do fall. Oh my god, dude. Why? I just can't that see the so tree scary. move up and up. Oh, that's so scary, man. Can't believe my no me lo creo. Que jeta. Que jeta, man. There are people with personalities where it's enough for them to just have someone tell them what is good and what is not good. And there's other people that they just gotta find out for themselves. <laughs> All right, my turn. There's a little bit about climbers that is that personality. Yeah, you can tell me that's a very difficult climb, but I won't know until I actually go and try it. In 
climbing, that's one of the things it's about. It teaches you how to push yourself. And it teaches you that even when you're on the limit, you can actually push just a little bit more. The only reason I finished the climb was because I saw how fucking big that whipper was. From once you're up there yeah. and you look down, and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not doing, I'm that. not doing this. I gotta finish the climb. Yeah, that's what I tried telling myself. <laughs> it didn't work. Dude. Yeah, and, and why, you know, why? climb hard you know like why climb the underside of these yeah trees when you can just climb at the top man. yeah climb on the back side i know so dude easier. it's it's true yeah what's the point it's kind of it's kind of stupid in that sense maybe when you can put yourself in so much so much pain through so much struggle and and you and you're able to control your mind and body and make yourself feel comfortable in that position you come out such a better person <laughs> yeah, that's why I climb hard stuff. Yeah. I think I'll make it right here. Bye, yeah. <laughs> welcome to Costa Rica, man. Así es como se toma café aquí. Bienvenido, man. No, está super hot. No, Esto es. <laughs> okay. It's so hands of steel. Dude, how do you get such strong hands? Climbing so much? Nah, dude, I just grab the cafe like full on boiling. Cheers. Because there was a hurricane last week, the bridge got washed away. So we have to take the little um, cable car across. My name is Grace and I am a tree climber and tree lover and tree planter. The life I was living really did not feel right. I was really stressed and anxious and then when I moved here it was really different. The pace of life was a lot slower and I actually had time to start rediscovering this love of nature that I had as a kid but really feel like I lost when I was middle and high school. Welcome to the tree. The approach is harder than the climb. Climbing. Were you, you were you a strong climber? Were you no. A climber? <laughs> no, I was pretty. I felt pretty weak. Definitely didn't have a lot of like muscle mass to show for it either. But it was nice. I was climbing with some guys who were really strong climbers. So they're doing all these hard routes, and then I didn't stop myself from trying what they were trying. And all the trees that they went out to climb, I would give a shot. I started actually getting up into the canopy 
And that progress just felt so satisfying, like to even just get a little bit higher on a root or to finally get into the canopy of a tree that I've tried a bunch of times. That's such an amazing feeling. Ray's got so good. You should see the routes you can do now. It's fucking crazy. I think you can feel the strength of these trees while you're climbing them. Because you're kind of pressing yourself and wedging yourself against these incredibly strong buttresses and branches and root systems that have spent hundreds of years growing. And you, I think you just can't help but feel strong when you're squished yourself in the middle of all that. Now I do feel super strong and I can climb really hard routes and I can keep up with these boys, <laughs> uh, which feels really good. <laughs> Our crew is filled with nature lovers, I think more than anything, and an incredible respect for the, for the place we have, you know. Me encanta interactuar así con mis amigos. De estar todos arriba en un árbol, estar en una hamaca apreciando el sunset, escuchando los pájaros. Y eso es un regalo de vida para mí. Biggest climbing inspirations. I'd say Nalini. Yeah, is number one. I think she's been a really big inspiration for all of us. Continuing down this path and seeing it as a possible path to go down. It's like a weird thing, climbing trees, even now. It's like, what the hell are you doing? You're gonna kill yourself. What's the difference between up there and the fourth floor? It's like, why do you even do it? And, uh, and I still feel that when I climb. And I can't even imagine what Nalini felt when she was really pioneering that stuff. And I admire her a lot for that. Anyway, these little seedlings grow on the branches. They put their roots into the canopy soils. Sometimes their roots start growing down from the branch and it keeps growing down further and further and further and further until it hits the ground and then gets access to the water and the nutrients that are available on the forest floor. That fig plant starts growing much faster. It puts out other roots, starts growing down to branches, growing down on trunks. The roots get bigger and bigger until they form kind of trunks of their own. It's these pillar-like roots that surround the host tree and make what looks like then the trunk of a, of a big mature strangler fig. Los ficos para mí los relaciono con, con una danza. Ellos están creciendo y están danzando y se van conectando. Y aunque no escucho con palabras lo que tratan de comunicarnos, me van contando como lo que es la longevidad y lo que es este mantenerse fuerte a pesar de de las condiciones y los cambios. Si sí, sí, hablamos como de espejos, eh, un ficus para mí puede ser mi espejo de cómo, cómo me siento. It's crazy to think about the beginnings and like the early beginnings. Like at first, I would just climb for funsies, you know, climb a tree, like any tree. Um, and then the trees got bigger, or they were always there bigger, but we just found bigger trees. Some of them we would climb, and there were ways of climbing them, and some of them we just did not have the knowledge you know, or the equipment to climb them. Um, and as the years came by, we started getting more knowledge, uh, we got more equipment, we got more skills, and then the trees uh, started getting smaller, <laughs> you know, like, walls or trees that just at one point seemed impossible are now possible. Um, so 
So we've come to one of the most beautiful and challenging trees here in the zone. Never tried this underside of the, of the tree, but um, I'm excited to get to know her and uh, she seems beautiful and like she'll, she'll make you want to work for it. These guys take their toes instead of their fingers. <laughs> they sit so hard. Like the whole time you gotta be like... Yeah, there you go, man. Yeah, feels good, right? Whoa. So wet. Dude, this is gonna be a disaster of a climb, and I can feel it already. <laughs> These bees! Ah! <sighs> what is this? <laughs> it's a climbing hold on a tree, man. Get me out of here! Oink, oink. The juiciest tree I've ever darn felt. Oh my god. Oh. Nice, dude. Yeah, do it. Oh, oh, oh. Woo. Oh, I got nothing left, man. You can lower me. Woo. There's a series of branches pretty high up that go way to the left. One of them has a big fork leading to a trunk that goes almost overhead. So I'm going to shoot over where that fork is. We're studying epiphytes in the context of a changing climate. An epiphyte is very simply a plant that grows on another plant. So they don't have access to ground resources such as water and nutrients. They have to get everything from the atmosphere. Epiphytes are not parasitic either, so they don't, they don't hurt the host tree that they're growing on. The branches are just covered. Every square inch of them are just covered with these interacting, overlapping bromeliads and ferns and orchids. It's like a coral reef where everything is packed on top of each other. These epiphytes are not just these isolated little pockets of cool plants, but they're actually movers and shakers in, in the cycling of water, of nutrients. They're providing resources for birds. These plants, these epiphytic plants are providing nectar with their flowers. They're providing fruits for birds that come and use them. Epiphytes are ecologically very important. In the dry season here around Monte Verde, when there's a lot of cloud water typically, the, those clouds will get absorbed by the epiphytes and then drip to the ground, which therefore provides a sustainable dry season source of really high quality water for people that live downstream.
as a kid, like all of my best friends' parents were like world renowned biologists and stuff like that. Like it's always been a part of us. We were always thinking, oh yeah, we want to get up there, but you know, we don't want to destroy anything. We don't want to rip anything. And one of the things that I think about is how do we teach that respect to people that don't have that background? People that don't give, you know, about those things. Like people who uh, see us climbing these trees and they're inspired to climb and they go out and they do it in a reckless way. When I think of people climbing trees, recreational climbers or sports climbers, you know, there's a part of me that is worried about that, that they won't have the respect that they need to, they won't take care that they, are as, as little, they, they create as little destruction as possible, that they won't trample the floor and just mindlessly walk away. It is something that I still grapple with. Um, so I get I got laid off and right after getting laid off um, I was because of it I was pushed into a moment in my life where I really had to think about what I value the most and what I really want to do because that time was now like a blank sheet of paper um, all of a sudden you know we could rewrite everything we could rewrite our stories and we could write our our our, our fantasies and our dreams and, and actually have time to fight for them. It is always in response to hardship that a person can really show what they're made of. It's in the, in the most difficult moments and in the harshest moments of your life where you can actually shine the brightest. Dude, that was right like on, the man. gnarliest climb. It's such easy. My easy. No puedo esperar para que me des, my. You gotta feel this too. Oh. It was a big tree, it was meaningful for me. Um, I really wanted to climb it. But I, I wasn't there, you know, the climb was there and, and the climb said, 
hey, in order to do this, your emotional level needs to be here, you know, and you need to be willing to throw down this much of yourself for it. Um, and and I wasn't able to do it, and it was it was like heartbreaking. <laughs> I'm not able to live up to the expectations that I have for me to perform on this tree. Okay, me bajas, porfa. The jungle and the tropics in general are very crowded. There's just tons and tons of different species and individuals. So everybody's kind of growing on top of each other and competing for sunlight, competing for nutrients. So it's a really busy environment. There's a lot going on. It's kind of like an explosion of life. <laughs> I think a lot of the sadness and pain that we're experiencing just collectively comes from this severed relationship that so many people in the world have with the natural world. Something that I think about is that there are, you know, there's these 100 year old, 150, 200 year old trees that I'm climbing right now. And I want my kids to go and, you know, send some roots that I put up with Izzy one day, one sunny afternoon in Monteverde. Sadly, unlike rock, trees will be more affected by climate change. Like I, I, maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe my son or my daughter will be able to climb this one tree I climbed in 2018. But maybe my grandkids won't, you know, because we're losing the rainforest. We're losing the cloud forest. There's pretty good evidence that the clouds, which normally would bathe the forest here on Monte Verde, are actually increasing in elevation because of temperature changes. We think that the epiphytes are pretty vulnerable to climate change in that the, as the clouds continue to rise, those epiphytes won't have access to direct cloud water inputs anymore. You see a whole lot of young strangler figs. I mean, why are they all the sort of the same age? They might have all come in at the same time when it was an unusually wet year. Many trees in the cloud forest, probably the figs also, uh, take up water and nutrients through their leaves. And so, yes, I think you can say that whole system is, is under threat. And you talked about you know, how we should change our, maybe change our attitudes about strangler figs. Like, I hate referring to strangler figs as stranglers because I don't actually think they strangle the tree. I think they are just living out their own lives and doing what they need to do for themselves to, and their offspring to survive. They provide a disproportionately important role in terms of providing food for mammals and birds. Just like the keystone of, a, of an arch, if you take it out, the whole arch falls down. 
even though it's just one stone out of 50 stones in that arch, that's the keystone one. That's the most important one. That's the critical one. If you remove those figs, even though you're only taking 1% of the biomass of the forest away, you're actually endangering this whole cadre of birds and mammals that are dependent on those figs for their habitat, for their food needs, for their energy needs, and so forth. Sometimes climbing at night helps you like really focus on what's in front of you and not be like distracted about the rest of the world. So sometimes you can like really just be in it only with you and the tree, nothing else. Izzy, you ready? Yeah. Cool. Climbing. And uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to be able to climb them. And I guess it, it, it is our duty as people who enjoy climbing and find such a deep link to it that we, we are responsible to, to save them or, or do something about it. When it's a really hard tree, I will often just get stuck in my head a lot of like self-doubt comes up and questioning like how good I am as a climber and then it's really easy to slip into like how good I am in general. <laughs> if we allow ourselves just to be overwhelmed, then we're not going to get anything done. And I think you see that in climbing. Like if you let yourself stay in that overwhelmed state for too long, you get tired and you have to go down and you can't finish the route. So I think we're actually at a moment where we're kind of like holding on right before we have to do a really big move. And if we keep hanging on like we currently are without just going for it and trying it, then we're going to get too tired and we're going to run out of time. I'm not saying everybody needs to become a climber, but <laughs> the more personal situations I think that we experience where we're really challenged and then can push through that challenge and overcome it, then the more confidence we have. There is definitely something to, to do with trees. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> putting the strategic fast growing trees yeah. in like the key areas yeah. and then intermingling some of the older, some of the older. like Bigger by using streets. that stratification exactly, yeah. would be perfect. For me, like uh, being able to see facts about how uh, nature is being destroyed all over the world and how doomed we are. Uh, it's not really inspiring any sort of change, you know, if anything it's demotivating. More than anything, what has changed me the most is being able to climb trees and say, dude, there's some serious power in this stuff that I had not witnessed before. And there's some serious respect to have had for these trees. Sometimes it's those very difficult trees that really make you feel those all of those emotions and, and sometimes have to deal with them. Am I, am I scared? Am I, am I tired? So if I'm tired, then maybe I think I'm not going to be able to do it. Or, or I've tried so many times and I haven't been able to do it. Like, what tells me that I'm going to be able to do it this time? I once heard a comparison, uh, 
guy talking about flow. He said um, that emotions are like like a stallion with so much pent up energy that that's ready to rush and, and win you the race, and you're the jockey trying to control it. And if you don't if you don't control it and you're not able to manage it, it'll throw you off and stomp you down and kill you. But if you can get those emotions, all these, these strong emotions that are being brought up, fear and courage and, and pain and subtlety, um, if you can control all those emotions and use them in your favor and use them as fuel, oh man, I don't think there's a better feeling in life. You know, I think uh, it, you have this superpower that lets you just glide up anything, anything you want. Good job, man. Good job. Let's see that pump. <laughs> Look at this. Oh, God. Um, but in the end, at the end of the day, it's just the time, you know. And, uh, in the physical world, it's not that meaningful. Um, but the meaning in it for me is, is knowing that I can, I can put that much effort into something. You know? It's nice to know that that strength is there. Something I hadn't felt in a while. I guess that's what tree climbing means to me now is, is proof that you can really fight for it. You can really step up. It also showed me that if there's something else I might want to do, something that is resonates inside me, just like tree climbing did when I first started out in science, then I should go ahead and follow that instinct. I should put my resources and my efforts and my soul and spirit into it to pursue that. And I know that I will be able to do it because I did it with forest canopy work. So I can apply that same belief in myself to other aspects of other things that I've tried. We got a lot of the materials donated. Big shout out to Cornell University and uh, the team of Vertical Ventures in St. Petersburg, Florida. Like the idea of this is to have anybody that wants to climb, they, they have no, no barriers in the way, you know. La comunidad de escalada está conformada por un grupo de jóvenes brillantes, auténticos. Es fascinante pasar tiempo con ellos, me inspiran y ellos también están inspirados. Nuevamente todo esto se complementa para mí, para mi crecimiento como persona y ayuda a enfocarme en qué es lo que quiero hacer, quién quiero ser. planting a tree in the ground. I don't think there's a way to feel bad about that activity. <laughs> it just feels inherently good. You know you're doing something good for the planet, for your community, for future generations. <laughs> we did it, guys! <laughs> we did it! I know! <laughs> ¿Cuál es tu nombre? Meredith. Qué lindo nombre. Yo me llamo Rafi. Man, kids have this energy of exploration and of proving themselves as capable. 
and um, curiosity. I think that a change in their minds uh, is the most valuable change that we can do into, into society. Any connection to Earth is beneficial. So do I think we are helping? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> you know, because we are, are helping people fall in love with nature again, fall in love with trees. Because, you know, when I was watching your film and I was seeing you guys climb up these stranglers and I thought, oh my God, everybody who sees this film is going to want to come down to Monteverde and climb these exact same fig trees that you are. And what will that mean to the figs? And oh no, what about, uh... And then I realized, no, that isn't the message of this film. The message of this film is for people to fall in love with whatever aspect of nature that they happen to encounter in their lives. They can catch the enthusiasm and the reverence, I think, that you have for them and translate it to whatever it is in their lives that, are, that is nature. When I look into my heart, I see trees. This is actually an image of a real heart. There are trees in our hearts. There are trees in your hearts. When we come to understand nature, we are touching the most deep and the most important parts of ourselves.